Hey guys, what is going on? It's Alexander Williamson here with the secret history of living in your aquarium. So we have a new setup like we had last time, but this time even better. I got to build the studio, built, build the studio now, uh, decide how I want to situate uh, this whole mic situation. And uh, also, you know, if I want to do with a wireless headphone version, get a wireless chip card for this and uh also how i want this whole like the ring light plus i've got now i've got the uh reflectors on either side but i can't turn it all the way uh but yeah so we got some improvements going on here not to the stage yet that's coming though i promise uh so how are y'all doing tonight today this morning this afternoon whatever it is wherever you are I'm cool with that. Let me pull up the chat on my cellular tellular device and we'll start talking. Now, I have a couple things I want to talk about tonight, including fish news you can't use, but it's interesting, right? So uh, we'll want to hear about that, I think. The fishery this week uh, for members, uh, again, only a buck ninety nine if you want to be a member. And then you get unlimited access to all the audio uh, formatted stories that I do. So I do four stories a week, usually about 45 minutes worth of episodes uh, every Monday morning. That's like four to five stories that are in the news. And then I link to the academic journal. You know what? Let's just take a look at what it looks like after I get you guys up on the stream. But it's so good to see the folks that I see in the chat right now. I want to see who's really here because StreamYard is a down dirty liar. They they are uh, they don't tell the truth when it comes to who's actually in the uh, the room, uh, as it were, the digital room, the meta room, the the meta room. Let's call it that. Uh, also, I got better tape for the camera, so uh, I know you guys probably really liked it when uh, I was using, uh, you know. I was MacGyvering it with uh, with literally uh, these for the cords and this for the camera and rubber bands to hold things around. But now we got gaffer tape because I'm taking it serious. Mm. We're, we're going big budget, y'all. Uh, so let's get up the stream so I know who's even her. I'd love to know who her is, who... Her are who are her uh the other thing is depending on what time we wrap this up tonight uh crack one if you got one <sighs> start sponsoring me it's only been five years dr pepper come on they offered to send me a little cooler like a little mini fridge a little useless mini fridge that holds three adult cans or four of the little teeny mini cans which i'm like why would i care to hold four like anyways so i have uh i had aspirations i had these grand hopes these grand dreams where i wanted to have uh a big 20 pound co2 tank kind of looking like even bigger than the tanks that scuba divers wear and i wanted to literally uh wrap it so it looked like with vinyl so it looked like a uh a full-on dr pepper two liter bottle or uh you know like the big bottles and then have all the valves and everything at the top have one go to a line with the syrup for dr pepper and the other so we could have dr pepper on draft in my fish room and the other going to one of my aquascapes which then you know dr pepper would be sponsoring essentially and i would get to build some really cool aquascape um but Alas, that never came to fruition. You know, pie in the sky, sky, sky pie, pie sky. You know what they say? Sailors take warning when there's pie in the sky. Um, can you guys hear me okay and all that? Um, let's see here. You Come on, Dr. Pepper sponsor. This man, he probably keeps your business alive as it's that gross. Yes. Many uh, Australians, Europeans uh, don't like Dr. Pepper. Asians tend to love it. Some some Europeans really like it, but the majority I find are like, ooh, what is that taste? Um, so, yes, 
you can see right up my nostrils in 4K, Lee. Wheelie, Wheelie Wilcox, the governor of South UKsville. Um, all right, we gotta quiet this down. I don't want any feedback. I don't need any lip. I don't need any feedback. All right, live chat. All right, now we're rocking in the free world. We're cooking with gas. We're kicking some bass. Uh, that's what I was gonna say. Depending on when I wind up this stream, wind down this stream, uh, I will be able to uh, possibly take you guys to a pond that is four blocks, so 300 yards or so down the, the road. And at at uh, sunset, because it's been around 95 degrees, 94 degrees Fahrenheit or 35 Celsius or so uh, in the day. Uh, and I, like in the day, the, the lakes are just, or ponds are just still and murky and gross. But at sunset, the mosquitoes, the little larva, the, the birds, the bats, everything's swooping and going all over. And the fish are just, looks like the water is literally boiling in this one little park by my house. And I wasn't even sure if there were fish in that water earlier in the year. Uh, it's where I've done a couple nature videos and been like, hey, you guys think there's fish in there? And we talked about uh, mycorrhizal relationships with fungi and bacteria and how bacteria fixes nitrogen for the fungi and for plants and how they they all kumbaya need one another you know that kind of stuff um but uh i went there the other night with my dip net and a couple guys had their like high-tech bass rods and their flat little uh river uh drift boats you know that they'd launch with their electric motor in there even though it's a teeny little like bathtub of a pond uh, probably shouldn't have a boat launch, but it's for non motorized engines. But in any case, so I just down and I get like eight bass and a bluegill and a pumpkin seed fish all somewhere between like yay big and yay big, but big enough that you could see what they were up to. Um, so kind of interesting. Uh, yes, it is still light outside here. All right, let me see who's in here. Then we'll go over a little bit of fish news. And then I was thinking today for the live stream, depending on if anybody, if y'all have lots of questions and stuff or all of whatever we want to talk about, uh, then I was thinking that we could also uh, maybe take a look at some new imports that are online at various different uh, retailers, check out like maybe... Uh, aquatic arts stands fish or redfish bluefish just see you know who's got the goods and, and what they've got if anything's uh really cool on there talk about the species when when we come across them see what y'all know if you guys have any suggestions of other sites we should check out we can do that too um all right guys so i want to give a super thanks to the folks of you who have been here early and uh, also those of you who liked and shared the latest video, the top 10 most popular fish in the country. That was a pretty successful video. I, I kind of had a feeling it would be not so much for y'all who are here all the time, but maybe uh, reaching out to some of the folks who aren't here on the regular. But the problem is not so much that I want to make content that is super nerdy or educational and a deep dive, a 15 or 20 minute video on the difference between cardinal tetras and neon blue tetras. That's a video I, I have, um, but it's not, it's not so much that it's, it's like that I want to make those things and, and, uh, they don't get views. The, the thing is that even people who are subscribed with the bell alert on who want to know about live streams, who want to see videos in theory, there's 30,000 of y'all and the bell on is like another 40% uh, of you which no offense if it's not on or whatever. Um, you know, I wouldn't click the bell on if I didn't want to see most of the videos someone was making. Uh, but even the people with all those alerts on who come and regularly check out the site, they're not getting alerted. Like my impressions the last month or so had been down in the like 10,000 range when the video would release for the week. Meaning that out of 32,000 subscribers, it wasn't even showing half of them by the end of a week. And then when I look at the breakdown of who's a su subscriber, who's a unique view, who's a return viewer, it was breaking down so that I figured out that there were less than 5,000 subscribers even alerted. They had to come to the website. So the problem is not 
uh, like, oh, gee, do I want to make stuff that's, you know, more clickable and more um, like, I don't want to say dumbed down, but less specific, more kind of uh, transitions, more B-roll, more production and quicker paced uh, without as much detail or storytelling or personal uh, narration. It's not even about that. It's just you have to make it popular enough to get past this threshold with YouTube now that it'll show it to your own subscribers who already said they liked whatever style it is. So that's the really frustrating part. So pardon me if you don't like the uh, 30 second or 60 second shorts that I'm trying to do here and there now. Uh, YouTube's really pushing that. I'm trying to see if that will help. Simply alert those of you who already know about it. Because I've had some people that are really incredible, great supporters of the stream. And, uh, you know, they like and they're they're always here or they're always in the comments and they're like hey man you haven't streamed for a couple weeks are you doing okay and i'm like what are you talking about i've put out five videos this week or whatever and they're like no way and they go and check and you know sure enough like they're not clicked on so interesting um yeah that that's going on uh oh did i see someone's got uh somebody's got a boo boo uh let's see here we got fish nerds that are sick. Who? Uh, watching this in New Zealand, recovering from surgery at home. Uh, ah, sorry, Mel. Uh, I hope that you're doing well, though. Uh, I, I hope that you get better soon. I, I sure know how that goes. I've had lots of different surgeries, and boy, do I know. I've got more to come yet. I still have to get my implant posts done i got all the graphs done and they also fixed my upper palate from the lightning strike thing happened but then they had to um they had to do a, a bone graph and then they used a piece of coral which is kind of cool like a dry white matrix of coral and then uh then they put in uh, gum tissue that they took from part of the gums and they had to graft all that in and now it's good to go, uh, and they can start doing the posts down into the bone. And they literally use like a dre not a Dremel, but a, like a, a Dewalt drill, like, and uh, drill it down in there, get the posts in there, and then what they'll do is they'll have a bar. So finally, I'll have my lower teeth back after like a year and some change, a year and a couple months, uh, and then it'll be time to do the top teeth. And I won't have uh, the janky super space teeth. Uh, that I know some people say are endearing. You know what else is endearing? Buddha. And he's fat. He needs to lose some weight. So get over it. Get rid of the gap. Okay. So how is everybody doing who is here early? I like to give you guys a shout out because I've been waffling on and I've yet to do that. But Mike's Tank Syndrome. Hello. Lady Rorschach. Hello. Uh, Mark Sterlison. Hello. Buttface. Hello. Uh, verily, verily, KC. Angie McGee, that kind of rhymes. Uh, Irene Drew, oh, Duel, <laughs> or Duel. Uh, I don't know how to do this, but uh, I hope I, I hope I didn't butcher your name too terribly, Irene. But thanks for being here. Uh, also, who else is in here hiding? Well, of course, there's Lee Wilcox, the Lee We, the Lee Wilcox. Craig Doniger, Linda Worth, Seth Fernandez, Chu, Craig, Brian LeVay, or Levy, Levy, uh, I'd like to levy uh, everyone's attention and say that he's awesome. He got me uh, this computer that he was using for his own purposes, and he sent it off so graciously when mine bit the dust, and it's pulling through. I need to buy a new, I need to buy a new uh, computer with you know, some super good processing and uh, RAM and all that. But, but for now, uh, and, and I guess storage, I mean, the cloud I store a lot on now. Like I was adding up all the things that now just running the channel that I've been subscribed to, whether that's, you know, I have a Dropbox and I have a Google expansion for my email for all the pictures and stuff that get sent and all the drafts that go back and forth when I'm working on a project with graphic design on other stuff or the little kids coloring book that I did, which hopefully I'll get a copy of soon. Uh, and 
I was realizing like, wait, I'm spending how much for those subscriptions and then the academic journals, uh, you know, 399 bucks for this and then $29 for the full Adobe suite. And then, you know, like it added, it added up to like $500 a month. And I was like, man, I should probably streamline this. Like all it's death by a thousand cuts. You, I, I guess you uh, got to be careful because you're like, oh, 1599 a month. That's not so bad. And over and over and over. So, uh, yeah. Uh, first class fish. What's going on? April Cannon. Hello. Um, Daniel, uh, Daniel, uh, Freda. Hello. Um, always lurking. Well, that's, that's good. One, eight, six element. Good to see you. Yosef. That, that was, I don't know why I said Yosef, uh, Joseph Ariando Benjamin. What's up? Uh, Aquatic Morning Show. What's going on, Jess? Good to see you. That is where you can find uh, the Aquatic Morning Show, or Jess Min, Mains, Tail, Fins, and Fur. Uh, that is where you can find uh, my uh, videos if you're not a member. I don't believe in walling off who gets to see what because they have money or they're contributing money to a cause. I believe that education and information should be available to everyone. It's just you're going to have to watch the Aquatic Morning Show. Do me a little favor. See my friends, all the great people that are over there daily putting that together. Uh, you're going to have to go over there and, and sit through that. Or if you want to be a member, you can get it all at once and watch all four or five episodes uh, at the same time uh, or listen to them too. So the, they will be launched as a podcast, like an official podcast on Spotify soon. They've already been all uploaded and then like, you have to segment them for sponsors uh, on the thing so that there's like an ad break. And I was like, well, what if I don't want an ad break? What if I just want to pay $299 a month to like host it and have no ads and just have it up as a podcast for the people without ads? And they're like, well, I mean, you can say that it's brought to you by your own company, but the, the format is you chop up the actual episodes so that it's kind of just like TV, like there's just built in these slots for the breaks and, and then it returns to regular programming. So it's kind of interesting. The more you know. Ding, ding, ding. Uh, Dan Leach, what's up? Uh, who else? Who else? Who else? Saga 69, what's up? Scattergun? Uh, J-Man uh, Hatch 17, what's up? Uh, fish dreams. Good to see you. Of course. Uh, I'm going to, okay. I'm going to scroll down. I'm probably going to skip some people, but a lot of times people pop out by the time. So I'll know who's here by who is interacting. Uh, Stephanie Cooper. Hello and welcome. Thank you so much for suggesting that people hit that like button. It really does help things travel, helps, uh, the ball get rolling. Um, uh, and, uh, the aquatic morning show says be a member here first for sure. Well, be a member wherever you like. Uh, I'm just I'm just laying out your options. This is a free country, but that's very kind to you, Jess. You are quite the woman. Uh, Dragon Lair, always good to see you, Patrick. Uh, Karen, hello, 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 Karen. Uh, D. Michael, another one bites the dust. You're just gonna do this to me again, aren't you? You're gonna make me sing. Because you know I have a compulsive. It's like, uh, what's that called? Uh, when you're, when you you say swear words, I have that with like music. Like I hear a beat in my head, and I have to like hum it or do something, or sing something else, or I go nuts. Uh, it's kind of like that episode if anybody watched South Park, like in the '90s, when Cartman has to finish sailing by. Uh, sticks i'm sailing away so if anybody started it <laughs> they would go uh nuts hey thank you so very much craig says just shared on my community tab alex well i really appreciate that thank you uh you are a true gentleman and let's say scholar i don't know if you're a scholar but you seem like you're a smart dude so i bet you're a scholar uh all right yeah turrets turrets um, oh, you got Dark Knight Rams today, Ryan? Right on, dude. Uh, Pavlov's vocalist. <laughs> yeah, except I feel like Pavlov would have picked like a good vocalist or had auto-tune. 
Mel Warren, what's up? Best hobby ever? Yeah, I can go with that. You don't say, Alex. We're shocked about this news that you have to compulsively sing. Well, yeah. Zombie Cat, so good to see you, my friend. Kelly, it's always good to see you. That's the, the nutrition facts. I don't need to know about the 9 million grams of sugar. Uh, cheers to you. Uh, I slipped in silently. Jimmy P. Well, yes. Yes, you did. Uh, creeping up the back door. Remember that Stray Cat song? Um, oh wow, Dragon Lair. I'm 46 years young, and today I realized I've been keeping fish 65 years. Uh, 65 years. Wait, Dragon Lair. Oh, you're 46, and I hope to on one oh one day realize fish keeping 65 years. Yes, yeah, I I wouldn't be opposed to that either. Uh, yeah. Um, <clears throat> We're, we're, I guess we're calling out Patrick's, I mean, Dragon Lair. Maybe I just outed your name, too, for those of you who don't know. Uh, our distinguished friend of the community, Patrick, um, who's always sending me interesting articles. You know, that's another thing that I that blew my mind this week was that the Rio Grande River is dry in, in Albuquerque right now. And then also that, like, uh, you know, there, there were just some interesting news stories as well as, oh, I have some exciting stuff to tell you. So let's get into the nerdy fish stuff. If you guys have any questions, I've been reading about this because I keep wanting to make a video about bettas, betta splendens, the history of humans keeping bettas, and what a fascinating connection that is between uh, the species and humans and like how they've shaped each other, more so humans shaping the betta, obviously, but how that Im Im impacts with culture. And I've got all these like, I don't want to do this feedback loop thing, so I'm going to close that. Okay, so I've got all these scripts um, of, or they're not script. Well, they are scripts. I've written them, uh, but they're of notes for certain uh, videos that I hope to one day make. Or um, they're things like, uh, if you guys can see some of this, uh, you don't need to like read it. I'm just trying to show you the gist of that it's in there. But it's a lot of uh, excerpts from studies and stuff like that. And uh, what what just came out this week about bettas. So this is interesting no matter who you are, I think. But I'm going to have to tie this in to my documentary about bettas. I want to make like a 40-minute documentary on the history of humans and bettas. And I actually want someone to help me with editing. So if you're someone who edits, uh, honestly, I... I I'd like to talk. I had one person that reached out and I haven't spoken to again after the initial contact. That could be my fault. Uh, I'll have to double check the email. Uh, but I, I want what I want to do is kind of do the narration, send it to somebody like reading this script that's going to be like 40 minutes long. And then I have a whole bunch of B-roll of bettas all over and wild bettas that people that you amazing, wonderful uh, viewers also send me. I absolutely love it when you guys send me stuff. I mean, obviously it's cool on channels when people send boxes and care packages and they open things up and they're like, check out this antique, this or that. And they go about and they talk about it. That's a cool thing that I kind of like doing when it's like a show and tell type thing. And I like doing that when I buy species or when I use some service or whatever that's new. But what's even cooler is like books and scans and articles and uh, interesting tidbits of information. Or when somebody's working at a university and they're like, you know what? I have inside knowledge that this is uh, going to be happening or this, this study is going to be happening. Hey, I see that somebody uh, snuck in a super duper scooper chat. Who was that? Well, Steve Hubbard, uh, I also see that we've got a dollar ninety nine, and I want to thank you so very much. I don't, I hope I didn't miss any others because I'm not seeing any alert other than for this uh, other one. Wait, it disappeared. Oh, here we go. Alan, AGA participation fund. Well, Alan, maybe you'll have to uh, review or or play. Uh, 
some live streaming uh, reporting from the AGA. I do wish I was going. It's it's Chicago this year. Uh, the, the one time in my life uh, that it was ever going to be in Seattle. Of course, I was in Florida that weekend. I only got to catch like a day of it um, and had literally no sleep for two days before. But that's where I met Alan. And uh, he and I have always been tight ever since. And he's who helped me with the uh, Aquascape contest uh, year after year. So very kind to donate his time. And he's just helped out the channel immensely. Just so kind. Uh, Irene, a $6.99 Canadian super sticker. Now, that's what I'm talking about. That really does help. I really do appreciate it. Um, why would I do that when you're going to be there? You know, if I had a ticket, I'd come out to Chicago probably. I, I would have to double check that I don't have some you know, one of my very important save the world type, uh, meetings to be doing, but, uh, yeah. Hey, that's actually, okay. Side, uh, we've got in a, oh, holy, holy magoli, holy, holy magoli, magilly cully. Uh, is this, was this not an error? Do you need a refund, Craig? A $50 super chat laid down, blowing my socks off. I really do appreciate it because, uh, you know, I'm going to be spending more money on events, software, hardware. Like, you know, this, that all costs money, but uh, it's always this slump in summer. But I'm taking it this year not as a slump as like, oh, I'm defeated, but more as, well, I better kick it up a notch. And so I really, really, really do appreciate that, buddy. Um, but if you need uh, 45 bucks back, I would totally understand. I have sent super chats that were five dollars uh, intentionally and ended up being 50 accidentally. Uh, but either way, that, that was very, very nice of you, buddy. Um, I do do I do do appreciate you 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 you. Um, let's see here. So. Who else is hiding in here? 503 Aquatic. Shanna, so great to see you. Love to see you. Uh, Stephen Calum, so good to see you. Also, Alan, uh, <laughs> another $12. Thank you, sir. May I have another? Wait, no, you just did that. They, I don't need another, but thank you uh, so much. I do appreciate it. Um, you know, I wonder, did, why did I close close my eyes? What are you doing, honey? What? Oh, my wife just left me. Feel sorry for me. No, um, my wife uh, is going for a walk. She's going to the bass pond. She's going to get some bass without me. Um, let's see here. I'm trying to scroll through my chat because there's like chunks of it missing on here, which is extremely frustrating. StreamYard, get your act together. I'll pull it up on here. But I was going to read you a really interesting study. I'm still going to do that. I just got sidetracked, guys. Sorry. Delilah's Critters, what's going on? Jennifer Weaver, what is going on? Regina Phalanges, thank you so much for being here. As always, love seeing you. Uh, who else has we got? Uh, I said Mike's tank syndrome earlier, but D. Michael. Uh, Zana Dudu, what's going on, buddy? Sky Dancer, so good to see you, too. Oh, everybody's rolling in. I guess, I guess the cool bus just got into town. Uh, eyeball pirate. I I don't even know what to say uh, with that. Uh, what's up, fish fan? ABC aquatic biotopes. Uh, the party is here apparently. Wow. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, let me pull up yet again on here. Uh, those of you who are new to the chat, uh, I'd love to know if you're seeing a difference uh, because you know I over the years also. I have to thank Alexander Engelhart again for the fact that now we have AC and with the new AC I bought after the fact that, you know, he literally paid for AC. I ordered the AC and I put it up the, the year that we had 112 degrees last year uh, on a certain day and it killed so many of my fish. Well, then I went, we got another little one and then we were like, that's silly. So we gave that to a friend who, who paid us the, the price for it. Anyways, long story short, we got a bigger one. And now it can mostly cool the whole house up to about 100 degrees outside. It'll keep the house at around 78, uh, 80 Fahrenheit, um, which what is like 28, 20, 26, 28 uh, Celsius or so. 
But uh, what is cool uh, is now the fish room, if I leave the door open, seems to be under control, which uh, is awesome because uh, I am always, uh, you know, concerned about that. Um, so, guys, I feel embarrassed to ask what's going on, but apparently uh, I don't get to know what's going on. But everybody's saying thank you to Alex Engelhart, who I did mention about the AC, but I've seen I'm seeing it from before that. And I have no idea what he did. I'm sure he did something very kind. Uh, did he buy uh, memberships? What happened? Literally, my my feed is not telling me anything. And that is that's just wrong. Uh, uh, 50 gift subs. Holy cannoli, right on guys. So that's why it pays to have, uh, <laughs> that's why it pays. So this happened when Kenny got me some uh, gift subscribers. Uh, but, you know, thank you so very much. Go, guys, if you are now a member, if you're now a subscriber, just check out the community tab. There are going to be 113, actually there's more than that, extra episodes just for you that are there if you scroll back they're called fish tree there's four in each week of that every monday i drop those but then there's also extra posts of like oh hey guys i'm out fishing or i'm doing this or that so you guys everybody who's a member you all have access to that now too and the whole archive of it which is awesome and thank you so very much alex uh alexander i really appreciate that brother i i uh I'm so sorry that for some reason it doesn't tell. Oh, wait, it just now popped up, just now popped up when I, I hit refresh. So now I see it. Now I see the 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 gifted memberships uh, popping up. Uh, Gannon, uh, Gannon Garner official. Benjamin got one. Uh, awesome. Uh, thank you so very much. Uh, that's great. That works. It's just a gift. Uh, so. Um, very cool. 50 gifted subs. Thank you, man. Uh, very cool. Uh, yeah, I guess it does just take time to load. So I want to read you guys something really interesting and nerdy. So, you know, pretty on point with uh, the branding of this channel at this point. Uh, also, oh, 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 before I do that, watch, man, I have, I, I think I may have ADD. Oh, you think? Um, but I wanted to show you the fish that is on... Um, I can share my screen too, but I just, it was just quicker cause I wasn't going to do a whole segment on it. Uh, I did that on this week's fishery, but, um, where, uh, uh, this, this Oscar is actually now named, uh, Astronautus Mikolgii, which, uh, or Rio open re Rio Orinoco. And, uh, very, very, very cool. Uh, but, you know, Ivan, who's a good friend of the channel, who who did that incredible biotope of the Orinoco book um, and is so knowledgeable. He's been working for 30 years on taking pictures of fish in their habitat. That guy, Ivan, well, he has uh, he has a fish named after him finally. You know, he's discovered like 23 unconfirmed and i think it's like 14 now officially named fish and he didn't have one named after him yet and i'm just so happy and i want to like thank you know him for being a friend of the channel i mean he and i we we're, we've been running this nonprofit, the uh green earth alliance and also i'll have more to announce about that that i'm excited about where we're doing micro uh grants not loans but grants to different uh grad students and research projects that are sustainable. They're about preservation or exploration of new uh, fish species. Hopefully that could be in the ornamental sector and in the food sector. Like if they intersect like tilapia or Oscar or discus, which is a very common food down in South America, then that is awesome. Uh, that's something that's great. And uh, we, we can, uh, encourage it. So it's similar to Dr. Anthony's goals, except for we're reaching out across every every country every body of water that's fresh uh, not just rivers and stuff but 
we will probably be starting in the developing world. So now we've got a few uh, gifted grants that have gone out that are just, you know, a few hundred dollars. Uh, but the Green Earth Alliance, we hope to get some funding from some corporate sponsors uh, probably by the end of summer. And hopefully what we're hoping for is basically I've been researching which ones are wrecking the environment in certain places for freshwater fish, uh, i.e., you know, mining companies like Consolidated Mining or uh, so like um, uh, Dole or Del Monte and their plantations on rivers uh, in the uh, shoot, offshoot of the Colombian basin that feeds into the Orinoco and then later the Amazon. Uh, so we were thinking, why not guilt trip them into sponsor our nonprofit? Then we can literally give the money straight to Colombian researchers who are like, hey, I only need $800 for a laptop and a SIM card and a cell phone. And then I can publish this, you know, 20 years of work that's all in typewriter paper. There's just these, these stories of like antiquated research and uh, analog research in the developing world that hasn't made it out yet, but it's done by people who are just as smart and just as, uh, you know, in, uh, credentialed uh, as anybody else. It's just um, they don't have the funding. Their universities in uh, Venezuela, go figure, don't have money to give, you know, tens of thousands of dollars for expeditions. So in these places, it's also an opportunity because instead of having to pay $200,000 and buy life insurance policies and all these things on those explorations, Ivan and I, we set this up so we can literally just get them the money and be like, go. It's your country. Uh, it's not like sending Americans or Brits to, uh, you know, Liberia or to uh, the the backwaters of the Southern Orinoco. Instead, you can just say, "Hey, uh, you Venezuelan teams, you're ichthyologists. Go down there, get your work done. What do you need to get it done?" And it's usually like a sad amount of money compared to you know, what Americans have to spend it. I mean, rightfully so they have to spend more money to get down there and fly there and the equipment and the technology is usually uh, more intensive, but you can still do taxonomy work and discovering new species and saying we need, you know, doing surveying work and use flying in a Cessna or some smart, small craft or even drones now and saying, we need to protect this area. These fish are spawning here. They're here. This species exists. This one is extinct. This one's going extinct. That's why we need to preserve it, because if we don't know it's there, we can't preserve it. So that's the whole point. That crazy tangent, though, was about uh, Ivan and the work that he and I are, are working on. And he's been doing it a whole lot longer than I have uh, living down there and all that. So um, I'm just so glad he got a fish named after him. And it's a beautiful one. It's a really cool Oscar. Um, uh, let's see. Uh Let's see here. Kenny. Wait, did I see Kenny? Somebody said Kenny. Is Kenny in here? Do I see a Danikin in here anywhere? Also, Regina, thank you so very much. I just saw your super chat. And Texas Fish Room, hello. Uh, Mondays are no longer boring thanks to the awesome fish fan. That's right. Yeah. Mondays are exciting. Mondays are party days. That, this is the day to drink yourself to the floor. That That's for sure. Um, Kyle Tom, uh, Thompson. Hello. Welcome. I mean, I, I just, uh, you know, and thanks again, Alexander. Now I'm seeing more, like, I don't know why it was so delayed, but now I'm seeing more of your handiwork. Jennifer Weaver. Hello. Uh, uh, everyone needs to watch Ivan's, uh, the fish guys expedition. Yeah. Oh, he's got videos that are insane where he's driving like 18 hours driving two miles an hour over these crazy potholes and they've got like military trucks helping pull them over or cows helping pull the, the car out of mud holes and they're shoving them and then they are like oh let's just walk and then he's still going out there lugging an aquarium with him to set up next to the river and take his pictures the guy is a madman and he's also one of the kindest sweetest guys I've, i i know in in the hobby uh, he's, he's not so, uh, cold or, uh, what's the word? Um, <laughs> yeah, the blue Tetra that, uh, Heiko Blair found needs to be named the Engelhardy. I, 
RDI. I do agree. Uh, I do agree. I would be much cooler with that. Um, oh, right on. ABC Aquatic Biotopes. You're going to be going to school in the fall for aquatic biology and ichthyology. That is awesome. I took some, uh, I took a marine biology class and then I took a botany and um, also I did a limnology, but it wasn't called that. It was called water processes and understanding water processes like 401 or 406 or whatever the class was, but it was for uh, archaeology. It was talking about like um, cold uh, ice cores, uh, dendritic uh, core extraction. So like tree cores, when, when you look at an old tree and, and you can tell what the climate and the weather did, and then you use that to make a timeline. So you take cores from a 20 year old tree, a core from a 150 year old tree, a core from a 2000 year old tree, and you line up and you can see like they all have uh, signs of drought on the same year. And you can use that to calibrate a timeline of these cores. Now you've probably seen them do that with ice and the ice caps. Well, the same thing is true in freshwater rivers and lakes. You can actually see the pollen and or the rise and fall of the water and, and where that is like rings on a bathtub is one way. The other way is literally the pollen from the, the, the summer season and spring when flowers bloom and, and spores are out. Uh, that stuff that gives us allergies is the stuff that then settles and is uh, left in the lake beds and uh, ends up being a, a record that we can read and, and it can tell us a lot and it goes back a long ways in some of our old lakes which is really cool uh alan bauer says uh the secret history living in your aquarium united showing round trip for 441 figure match that for a hotel plus graduation uh etc call it uh call it ag we can do that hey <laughs> i mean I, I can't stop you. That does sound awesome. Uh, a bones. Hey, welcome. Uh, I love your Seattle exploration and old growth trees. I'm in Spokane and we have nothing like that here that I know. Of. So out in Spokane, if you go to Priest Lake, Idaho, which I know, you know, it's up a ways, you got to go up to Newport and then you go out to Priest River and then you go up highway 57 for about 48 miles, I would say up to Priest Lake, there is a st stand of trees and it cuts back into kind of Meadowline Falls <clears throat> and uh, that area a little bit before Colville, if you were headed back west from the east uh, in Idaho. And there is a grove of trees up there called the Roosevelt Grove of Trees, not the one down in, there are several Roosevelt Groves of old trees, but there is a grove there. And you can walk barefoot on moss about two to three feet deep in spots, sphagnum moss. And then there's a soft green moss over that and la layers of like all these like interesting, like duff of the forest, like pine needles that are soft. And you can walk through that. And even on a hot day in the summer, it's all cool in, in there. And there are like 250 foot tall trees. It's about a two and a half or three hour drive from Spokane. But man, if you ever want to go see some old growth trees, there's also a real quick little area where they just missed like about i don't know 25 trees uh called hannah flats uh like the name hannah for a woman uh like a, like a jewish name hannah um which has the two n's like h-a-n-n-a -N -N -A h maybe uh but in any case yeah is really interesting michael you behave goodbye Ruby Tuesday, who could hang a name on you when you change with every new day? Still, I'm going to miss you. Uh, yeah, it rained today. That was odd. It rained this morning at around 4 or 5 a.m. And it wasn't just like, like at first I thought it was just humidity. Uh, and then it just like built up. Um Oh, interesting. Pam S. Awesome. Thanks for sharing. So I lived in Meadowline Falls when I was young. My dad and uncle were building the Boundary Dam right on it. My grandfather made me go see that dam so many times. And Boulder Pass used to go up there and catch the Pacific Northwest, uh, the little tree frogs when they'd be born. They were so teeny and cute. And you'd find like thousands of them 
at this rest stop up by that Boulder Pass place uh, when you're crossing into Colville. Uh, that boy, that's kind of the, or used to be the middle of nowhere. For all I know now, it's like housing subdivisions. But that used to be like three or four hours from a hospital uh, up in some of those back roads, back up by like Lake Chapaca and Loomis and uh, all that stuff. Anyways, uh, if people, um, those frogs were my entire childhood, I swear. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I never see them at all anymore, and that is such a bummer. Um, such a bummer. Okay, so I wanted to share with you guys, though, some nerdy news um, that will – and it's why, like, when I keep wanting to make this beta documentary – and I call it a documentary because I've been working on it for three years, uh, and I haven't ever done an episode on it, but I've done these, like, up close – or not up close. I've done these, uh, like – focus talks on it during live streams and stuff like that um chu welcome uh you have alexander Engelhart to thank for the membership he is a stand-up dude an upstanding dude so uh new research so you guys if you followed this story you know that they discovered that betas have been around for at least a thousand generations they assume in captivity now, they said that because of in normal DNA versus mitochondrial DNA. So mitochondrial DNA is just the female side, just the woman's side, uh, whereas the normal DNA is both pairs. And they recently, as in the last two years, year and a half, discovered, and it's, I have episodes about this too, discovered that sex of the fish is not tied to um it's not tied to the x and y chromosome it's actually tied to uh a gene known as dmrt number one uh so because of that in domesticated bettas it's very common for them to have uh, two sets of chromosomes, and, and I said sets, two sets of chromosomes. So you can get a fish that is XXXY or YYYY, why, 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 no, uh, that's YYXX uh, or XXXX, uh, not triple X, but quadruple X. And also, you can get a YXXX, which is born a female, but can turn to a male. So they can change their sex depending on stressors. And I have, uh, there, there's all sorts of links to that also on old episodes of Fishery. That was super interesting to me. And they started finding that out about baddest and about, um, obviously, clownfish. Uh, also, sheep's head, uh, what are they, races, uh, and then... Uh, with a W and then um, a, a few other fish though, they were able to confirm that their gen, their, their sex different than gender uh, was not linked to their chromosome. Uh, and they found in, since the seventies, it's been kind of a known issue that betas can change gender on you as a young fish. You can sex them as, Oh, these are all uh, going to be female and you put them aside and six months later one of them has turned out to be a male ruins the whole project it's pretty obvious when it happens uh so it's been a known problem and it started out as like a weird quirky thing that they notice once in a while and now it's like a well-known thing in southeast asia and all the betta farms that that can be a real issue uh, so that was known. It was also known that their sex gene had hopped over to the S chromosome. So we have XY. Well, there's also a bunch of other sets of chromosomes. And S and T are other chromosomes. In reptiles and birds, their sex chromosomes aren't necessarily X and Y always. Sometimes they're on S and T. And in fact, they discovered a frog, which I talked about as well. Sorry, I'm like, oh, I talked about this. Uh, but I did. I'm excited about it. So there's a frog that they also discovered in Taiwan that has six sex chromosomes. So it has X, X, Y, X, 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 or it has Y, 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 X, X, X. Uh, it's just 
crazy what's out there. Uh, and it, and I said YX just now. I said, but but what I meant to say was like T S T S Y T S Y or whatever it is, because it's on different lettered chromosomes. But in any case, uh, what I want to get to is that new studies have been done sparked by the uh, the research that brought us to that point, to this information. And uh, the uh, this new study that came out uh, last week just says, uh, I'll just read some of the script that I'm writing for the documentary. You guys will get a little sneak peek here. Uh, oh my goodness. No, you did not do that. Did you, Alan? Hold on. Oh, Alan. 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 Uh, that doesn't really go anywhere, does it? Oh my. <laughs> what? Uh, I can't believe you set up a GoFundMe. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Oh, buddy. Uh, I love you. Uh, you're very thoughtful. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, what are the dates again? Uh, I never even thought it was a reality. Uh, but man, yeah, it would be really fun to go. Uh, oh, the 9th of October. Uh, as long as that way, when is fish the fish? Uh, the fish. Or wait, it no, it's. Wait, where is it? AGA 2002, Chicago. I don't know. Why can't I find it? AquaticGardeners.org. Uh, Chicago. Oh, September 29th through October 2nd. Boy, that would make for a killer month boy it would uh you can tell them i'll speak i'll speak on anything <laughs> um because yeah i'm going early in the month i'm going to uh what do you call it uh central florida area to speak and i'm going to stay a week there and then in mid-october i'm going to ohio that will if, if that were to happen if alan if you were to rally everybody uh, to raise enough money for me to go to the Aquatic Gardeners Association with you, uh, which I definitely promise I would bring back awesome plants to the Pacific Northwest. Uh, boy, that would be really cool. But uh, yeah, it'd be a crazy month. It'd be a lot of fun. Maybe we can get you to Chicago for Aquashella. That's, you know, that's the thing that I felt like you know, it, like as much as I want to go and Alan and I went to the Aquatic Gardeners Association back in 2019, that was awesome. I, you know, it was really cool. Um, and staying in the hotel and, you know, getting to meet people, getting to meet Crystal Castleman, you know, some of my heroes, uh, that was incredible. Alan and I got some pretty cool plants too. Uh, also, I met Kenny there uh, of Danikin Aquatics. That's where I met him. Uh, in person for the first time. And all that was great. But um, the thing is, it's not a ton of fish people. It's a lot of plant people, a lot of pond people and koi people. And I felt like, well, if I'm going to spend money, uh, quote unquote, on the channel and for myself too, obviously, because I want to go, it needs to be like the Triple Crown or Aquashella or this or that. Uh, but the Aquashella uh, event, I'll be speaking at Fishtoberfest in... Uh, October, mid October. Uh, and so I won't be able to go to the Chicago Aquashella, but I was thinking like the next Florida one, uh, I just like excuses to get to Florida. I've never been to, uh, the Dallas one. Oh, I've never been to any Aquashella, but the, the Dallas one was another one. That's a possibility. But anyhow, if you don't come, then who am I going to bump six from <laughs> riddle me that? 
Ah, uh, you're spilling the beans, sir. Uh, spill them away. Spill them away. You've earned the right to spill whatever you want, sir. Uh, Ilun, uh, Iluna, uh, man, I can't say this name. Ilunalan. I have an alien beta from Aquarium Zen in Seattle who completely ignores mirrors. It's such a chill dude, but makes me wonder on the set. So uh, they've also found that uh, some fish actually can do. Um, uh, oh, for sure says no need for a hotel. You can stay at my pad and I'll chauffeur and provide Dr. Pepper. Well, that would be rad. Only thing is I am like, really badly allergic to dogs i don't know if you have dogs but other than that like i'll sleep on a uh i'll sleep on a park bench i don't you know i'm i'm easy other than that um uh <laughs> alan is really working on this all right i will not be at the clash i mean all these things the problem is guys I, uh, you know, I, I had to decide what am I going to spend my money on? And I decided I'm going to spend my money on, I got a better, uh, compressor microphone. I got the better, um, camera here, the new webcam that's, that does up to 4k, even though right now it's streaming in HD, um, 60 frame. And then I have a new tripod and I also got some new software. So I decided to reinvest in the channel because I didn't have a whole lot of money to go to any of the events or anything this year because of the six grand I had in medical bills from my spine surgery that they said everything was going to be covered and it wasn't. So uh, I'm not like whining or begging or any of that by any means. I'm just saying it ended up where I was hoping to have the money and I didn't. And that's just life and that's fine. Um, but yeah. All right. Hold on. Let me boot this person. Uh, no. How did that happen? Uh, remove. <laughs> I tried to kick someone out of here and uh, and I made them a moderator, a spammer. <laughs> Instead of booting them, I clicked the wrong button and it made them a moderator for half a second. <laughs> oh, that was a good, good screw up, Alex. Good screw up. Uh, uh let's see here. Uh, all right, let's, yeah. Okay. I think we got it handled now between Alan and I. Okay. So back, let, let me get to the beta thing. Uh, but anyway, so I decided instead of going to Aquashella or, um, the triple crown, which I really wanted to go to, uh, I, I didn't, uh, Shanna had to work. We were going to take a train and be like, you know, um, we were going to just make a trip of it. And then Kenny and I were thinking about it way back for a while. Um, Kenny and I still want to take a road trip though, either down to LA or over to Wyoming, either way. Um, and then kind of live stream and make videos. I want to go visit a bunch of the lakes that right now are vanishing, um, uh, because of the drought and may never return just because the, the water allocation in the Southwest right now, a lot of it is in critical, uh, stages. And so they're literally saying, no, we can't. Uh, we can't do anything about this. Uh, we, we are not going to refill that lake until all the farmers have X, Y, and Z, or until uh, the hydroelectric dams have enough water that they can function, all that kind of stuff. And uh, so I'd like to see some of those bodies of water again. I, I saw them years ago, like Powell and Mead. But the, the other thing uh, that Kenny and I were talking about on the road trip was to see out in utah and a few other areas where there's been hot springs where there's wild cichlids there's like 20 or 30 species of wild aquarium fish uh in a few spots in idaho a few spots in wyoming and then a whole lake in utah that is warm uh so those were all things that were kicked around uh but in any case hey i just saw another uh little another little alert on my on my uh screen what did it oh hey joseph gorgel thank you so very much for the dollar 99 super chat very much appreciated it it means so much to me to mean that much to you i've been first and last look at how the time does pass but now i'm on my own at last rolling home to you 
uh, take a road trip to NY and I'll bring you guys collecting in the Adirondack Mountains. Oh my goodness, that would be awesome. Yeah, I'll be collecting in Florida and hopefully sending some stuff back. And I want to get prepped before September 10th, like throughout August. I want to redo a few tanks and just clear them out, replant them, get get everything out of there that's tropical fish and stuff, and do a couple biotope tanks for Florida um, for whatever I find. Um, uh, and uh, also... Uh, let me finish my thought that I was going to tell you guys on the update on bettas. So the bettas and domestication, this is about the history of bettas. So, uh, this new research that came out this week or last week, uh, 727 bettas were selected in Hong Kong, Vietnam, and Singapore, uh, at different fish markets for diversity of morphology. So different colors, different fins, all supposedly beta splendens. Um, we show that current breeds have a complex domestication history with extensive introgression of wild species. Even in the most remote locations, when we collected domesticated bettas, they generally had DNA from three to four other non beta splendid species, including Moschiansis, uh, Falks, and Rubra, which is outside the genus of that one, which is interesting. So using uh, GWAS, uh, we identify genetic basis of multiple traits. So they, they figure out with this genetic sequencing, um, the gene that is responsible for coloration phenotypes, how the thing looks. Also, the sex determination uh, gene, which is uh, marked as DMR2 uh, or DMRT number one. You guys don't really need to know the numbers. And then also there's a gene for long fin and half moon or full moon placots. And that happens to be lying on a section uh, which maps to KCNJ15. So beyond color patterns, scientists also were able to trace back which genes were first used uh, to change fish fin size, length, and shape in domestic forms. So while doing so, they realized that there's also a polygenic signal related to aggression. That means that this affects multiple genes within the genome, but they found that this gene triggers cortisol, epinephrine, and uh, several other uh, um, chemicals and enzymes in the body that trigger, in humans at least, aggression. And in mammals and mice, also now they can confirm in some fish. Now, they haven't for sure confirmed that in bettas this happens, but that's what li they're literally studying as we speak. So it turns out that the gene that turns on the color red being dominant, that deep blood red, it is because of anthocyanins, which are the same thing that make blueberries blue. They make blue coloration in other um, uh, animals' pigmentation and in plants and... Uh, like parrot feathers and, and uh, reptiles, things like that. Um, and they, uh, that gene that turns off or on how the anthocyanins and beta-carotenoids are basically metabolized into pigment, so how a fish can be blue, purple, or red is determined by this gene. And that's why you see that base color betta so very often as the cheaper bettas too, is they've got like almost like a metallic, like um, they look red from one angle, purple from another, and then maybe blue from another. And they kind of have uh, colors uh, that when you see from different angles, you'll see different tones, but it's all because of a structure of a chemical called anthocyanin. Well, that same chemical structure being increased in the amount of cells per square millimeter of the fish's skin and scales is also 
involving genes CAC NB2 and DISC1 uh, omega, which then happen to be linked to the colors of red and oranges, as well as beta carotene. So basically what it's saying is they've unlocked which genes were mutated, which ones were selected for that changed the red, yellow, orange hue of pigments, and then the purple, blue, and deep, deep magenta reds or mahogany reds, those colors, three different genes are involved in, in, in regulating them in betas. All three happen to correlate with increased aggression and stamina in those fish. So it's hypothesized that those fish were selected not for the, the fact that that was a pretty color or anything. It was selected for because culturally we have proof that uh, in the 1400 AD period, we know it's been written down. We see art from the time. We know that people were fighting these fish and not fighting them to the death or anything like that necessarily, but literally they would twist up and they would try to tire each other out and some could go for hours and different villages would breed them to do this more and more. And the one that was more aggressive or that engaged the fight first, sometimes got different points depending on, you know, how people were gambling, how people were settling disputes and all these other cultural things that are, were involved with betas. It got so bad to the point that, that actually the emperor uh, and the king of Siam, the emperor of the Khmer, uh, or basically he's got a different name there, but, um, the, the leader of the Khmer empire in Cambodia and, and part of Laos and uh, modern day Myanmar, uh, up into Angkor Wat, they know that there are these stellas or rather stones carvings where it says like, don't give in device. Don't be, uh, using, then they've got fish that look suspiciously close to wrestling half beaks or gold half beaks. Uh, and then they've also got uh, bettas, uh, which it doesn't specify which. And some look pretty wild. Some have big fins. Some have little fins. And it appears that there was evidence that they were already speciated by that. So what's the big news about all this other than we know now that anger, uh, aggression, and stamina, which is what you'd want in a fish that fights, uh, happen to be linked to the bright colors, is that basically... The hypothesis goes that the fish were already predisposed to being territorial. A lot of fish are. Cichlids are too. But these little fish are really hardy. They live in puddles. And over there, the temperature is fine all throughout Southeast Asia to bring them into little ceramic bowls or cups or ponds and to then either breed them or let them do their thing and keep them long enough that you can wrestle them with another fish. And they would do so, and they'd either put them in big uh, arenas that are like this thick and, you know, a white color or a neutral color. And then they'd let each fish go on either side and whoever's fish won, whatever it won. Um, and that actually prevented war in like the Chiang Mai and northern Thai regions where it gets pretty cold for bettas. So the, the theory was, yes, we know bettas were being domesticated or we know bettas were being fought. They didn't have proof that they were being domesticated. Well, last year, they proved that over a thousand generations of selections of genes were made that would be very, very unlikely in the wild. For instance, the gene that turns on those long fins that give you half moon bettas, full moon bettas, uh, the, the genes that give the placot betta um, its ability to have shorter fins. Uh, those genes were selected for when they were recessive on the maternal line over and over and over and over again, along with the aggression genes. So where in the wild would the pressures just be selecting for uh, aggression, short fins so they don't get ripped, you know, so there's less to grab onto, just like a pit bull or a fighting dog. And um, so they, they, they then were able to prove that that, had been going on probably by man, maybe not, but probably for at least a thousand generations, which in, in, uh, in, uh, better time, you could have a couple generations a year in the tropics. You could have two. So they said, okay, well that only proves back 500 years 
because you know you have to be conservative on these things uh and realistically though it's probably more than a thousand generations it's probably more than a thousand years because you lose generations you lose info you have redundancies where they just keep breeding the same line and they haven't altered it at all or crossed it um but what's interesting is that that correlates with the stellas the stone carvings as well as a couple scripts that exist in the Hunan province, which is southern China. Um, <clears throat> these ancient scrolls talk about how the king said, stop keeping bettas. Like it's leading to fist fights and people stabbing each other and violence and brawls and riots in like village squares and stuff. Stop. It, and then they realize uh, later on, 200 years later, there's more edicts that are passed down that are written because the Chinese were real good at keeping track of uh, information. But the problem was this info is kind of um, obscure and nobody had really relayed it into English from those scrolls. So there were some monks and there were some government officials that knew that this information existed, but they weren't like beta lovers or ichthyologists. So it was like, who cares? Like what's like, what does this have to do with anything uh, sort of stuff? And um, thank you, Alan, for knocking down the the adult chat bots. <laughs> uh, they love you long time uh, and then give you a virus. But um, yeah, so they then see that the kings say, you know what? Betas are legal again uh, because it's too hard to stop for one, like prohibition. And two, they found that people were actually having worse squ uh, squabbles and fights over like blood feuds and this village mad at that village for encroaching on their farmland or their rice terraces, things like that. Um, they were finding that the, uh, the betas actually were like a social mechanism, like soccer or something where people would get together and instead of beating each other up, that would happen. Now people would also get drunk and bet on things. And then, you know, that did lead to some violence, but it was far less than if it had just been all out chaos. Like there was a system, there was a culture and there, and uh, it existed even in these tribal villages and then became bigger in cities. And they have proof of that. Then they know that later on they were taxed and the King demanded to be uh, given, you know, the equivalent of today around $10 a fish or half the cost of the nicer fish that were being bred if they were going to be wrestled. And then of the pot that was won, there's another edict from another empire. Uh, I think it's like the 1756 uh, was the year off the top of my head. I don't remember for sure. There's another note uh, from the King of Siam talking about it. They were even gifted to Americans uh, in, in the American government, U.S. government, uh, as like a here you go. They sent over elephants and Chinese fighting fish or bettas, which didn't make it, unfortunately, um, in the uh, Civil War era. The elephants made it, though, uh, but the bettas did not make it across the Pacific. Um, but yeah, so that's all pretty interesting. We could approve that. We could prove all that which is great. So um, these polygenic traits suggest that the, the link to a phenotype that is now dominant or at least prevalent in most domestic bettas, blendens, uh, causes the default appearance of a short fin placot with blue undercolor and deep red and uh, red highlights as well as purple highlights, which are enhanced and intensified when these fish consume beta carotene, carotenoids, athetaskins, and anthocyanins, which we talked about earlier. Um, but these same, uh, all, all of this suggests that there are clear genetic markers in the D DNA of bettas um, from DMRT number one and then XX RT1 X, Y, R, T, 2, that their sex organs and uh, if they were going to end up being a boy beta or a female beta, uh, that that was not determined. 
uh, by the X and Y. Even though in general, it lines up with those chromosomes, it's actually a gene that's free floating. And they were able to figure out when that mutation happened. And they were also able to find that then what it was doing was it was making the females more peaceful, less likely to be red. During the same time, they have a source talking about new strains of beta that the females uh, are colorful as well and are no longer red. They're in blue and green and teal and, and lavender, these, these tones with stripes down the side. Um, so it's kind of interesting because they wanted the females to be not so uh, voracious so that they could spawn the fish and not have to worry about the, the mates killing each other. But um, in 90% of the XX by XX cross, the offspring were female. So let me say that again. Their, their chromosomes are XX. Uh, so you've got a XX female and an XX female. And they cross and they give you that new weird gene, which is XXXX, four X's. And yet, 10% of those somehow end up boys anyways, end up males. Um, and in the offspring of the XX by XY, which is what we would think of as a female and a male beta, 85% of the offspring were male, and 90% of the XY offspring were male. However, in the XX by XX cross Every offspring uh, of these fish uh, was female for a generation, and then it turns to male. So this is some really weird genetics, and this all happened like 700 uh, gene mutations ago. They can see the genetic drift in these things. And they also compared uh, or Orizias latips or Madaka rice fish that bear a DMRT1 uh, XXY and XY sex determination system. And in the summary, the results confirm that the DMRT1 gene is uh, located and linked to uh, sex in ornamental beta splendens. Also, they find that beta machiansis uh, has the same thing going on. Um, but that XY or XX did not determine the sex whatsoever. It is that DMRT that can float onto any chromosome and would float whenever they'd selected for that color red for aggression. So unbeknownst to them, they were actually causing these fish that could change their sex because they had made them so aggressive that the, you know, it, it, it's possible that the testosterone was so high and all that, that uh, those genes were also selecting for male traits like aggression to the point where it turned the fish into males uh, some of the time. Uh, but all of it, basically, when you look at it and corroborate it with each other, it means that there's at least a thousand years of these bettas being bred and that now they've nailed down the genes for why they were doing what they know the bettas were not bred to be pretty right away. They were bed, bred for their territorial fighting ability um, or, or prowess. The reason, like the, the fact that they did that, they probably found them in rice paddies because those have been around eight to 10,000 years. And then they also uh, can show that uh, in sites where they find rice grains that have been laid down, like I talked about earlier, in lake beds or rather rice terrace patties. Uh, they, they find a, a season of pollen, a season of, um, you know, ash from volcanoes from a certain year, whatever it may be. Okay, that chat bot is back. Let's get rid of them. Um, and then... Um, uh let's see here go away man alan thank you buddy uh i don't know why we got so many of those i don't know how this thing keeps coming back man that's very annoying uh but you rock alan um 
report. Uh, okay. All right. Sorry, guys. All right, guys. So, in any case, <laughs> um, yeah, it's it's just really interesting that now they can they can uh, corroborate these stories. And in archaeology, they don't believe human oral history, which is a bummer sometimes. Like, you could have just asked the natives, are there giant temples over in those jungles? And they'll be like, yes, our ancestors uh, told us about them. They're very sacred. And they'll just, like, ig ignore it. Uh, you know, the Western uh, scientists will be like, well, we don't have any proof of that. And then as soon as they find the proof, they're like, oh, my goodness. It, it's incredible, but they passed down this knowledge for 3,000 years since those temples were used, but there's temples under that forest. And uh, the, all along, the indigenous people are like, you know, but there are some crazy indigenous uh, mythological founder stories. I mean, look at the city of Rome, where they're like two boys were raised by wolves, Romulus and Remus, and they came together and founded a city or whatever. So, I mean, yeah, you, you, everything with a grain of salt, but when someone says there's a temple here or we've bred bettas for 1400 years or whatever, and oh, this scroll mentions it, yet we still have biologists and evolutionary biologists saying, not so fast. They might have been using wild bettas. You know, that's pretty early. I think, you know, they can't be older than goldfish because the Chinese were superior and they were, they did goldfish and that wasn't going on yet. So now we really have to consider was the goldfish first? Was the betta? Was a Eure Eurasian eel? Was the striped bass and the Wells catfish, which we know were kept by the Romans, Carthaginians, and the Greeks at different times. I mean, it's going to be very, very interesting uh, who wins the the story of oldest domesticated fish. And also, what does domestication mean? But with this study, even more so than with goldfish, they can say, boom, humans selected this gene. It makes the fish bright red. Why in the wild would that get selected for over and over because birds are going to eat them. They don't have any defense. They're fish. As much as they can fight other little fish, that is a terrible trait to have in the middle of a rice paddy in shallow water to be a bright, colorful fish um, all year round. That's not a good trait to have, generally speaking. So it, it, help, it, it helps explain that. But it also explains that when they surveyed all those wild bettas, and also other beta forms when they're like, okay, this is a beta, um, you know, whatever, a beta similis or something. They look at it and then they're like, oh, it has rubra and uh, falks or whatever, you know, some cross of other bettas in it. So what's being coming clear is that a lot of the wild populations that are colorful and things may not be fully wild. They could have been let go 500 years ago and disseminated back into the gene pool. And unlike guppies or, um, you know, caradina, neocaradina shrimp, instead of reverting back to completely wild, maybe they kept some of those traits because maybe a little bit of aggression was advantageous. Maybe that's why red is the most color in, the most prominent color in all 73 species of these bettas. Um, so in any case, I just think it's really fascinating. It's new gene work that's like come a million years ahead of time, uh, ahead uh, in such a short time. Very cool. Uh, oh, yeah. I, Marshall, I don't mind hybrids. Um, I think you need to tell people if it's a hybrid. I've hybridized um, CPDs and C and uh, erythromicron several times. I've hybridized a couple baddest species and a couple um, rainbows. But I never let them leave my care. I didn't give them out or sell them. And, uh, you know, I, I just ha made sure that um, at first I was like, well, I just have to inform people. But then I realized that's not enough. I don't want people to forget and then pass it on. And then there's this thing that contaminates the gene pool. So for my own use, I totally, or for your own use, I totally agree. Like, do, what you, do whatever you want with hybrids. My ethics don't lie in that inherently. They lie in when you do things like make a balloon body or 
um, a, a squat fish or, you know, when you do something to impede the way its organs fit into its body cavity or the way uh, it can swim or breathe or whatever it may be. Now, Martin W., I wanted to just give you a shout out. I did see your super chat uh, from down under. I do appreciate it greatly. I do, I do, I do. So I wanted to say thank you. Um, I was saying let's do some window shopping and take a look at what Aquatic Arts has. I think we're going to be changing my uh, my code that gets you guys 15% off again soon, which means everybody can use that again. Even if you've used it in the last few months, it'll be changing. But whatever that code changes to, it'll be in my most recent video. I'll put it there. But then uh, I might be kind of backing off from Aquatic Arts when the new website of Vivi launches, uh, V-I-V-V-Y, uh, Vivi.com, which is going to be a marketplace that Aquatic Arts is then going to jump onto. And they're going to invite anyone from Aquarium Co-op to Dan's Fish, to you guys, each of you, um, to Eric Bodrock or Greg Sage, anybody breeding fish, buying fish can join. You can build a profile where you build your tanks and then it gives you all the care info the water parameters, other fish that seem to work well with it, and then everyone in the U.S. who's sourcing it. Plus, there is going to be a discount on the packaging material for shipping the fish. And then beyond that, it'll be like you can post like seeking a male bristlenose pleco uh, that's super red or a female bristlenose pleco long fin super red, whatever it may be. So that should be really cool. Uh, it should be happening by the end of summer at some point. Uh, they keep kicking it out farther, um, but that's how new tech companies always seem to go. Um, so uh, I, I know I skipped a couple things, uh, but if you guys have any questions before we get out of here, I would love to hear them. Uh, I've got a little bit of time left. I've got a few minutes left, but then I got to get out of here. I got to fly like an eagle. Let my spirit carry me. Fly like an eagle. Uh, Thursday football, huh? G'day, Alex. Amateur aquatic addiction. Hello. Hello, hello, hello. Hello. Is it me you're looking for? Um, get out of my dreams into my car get in the back seat baby gonna duct tape you and tie you up uh you know that song creepy like everywhere you go every breath you, you know you guys all know that one's creepy too there's a lot of creepy songs out there turning japanese that's a pretty dirty song uh let's see here craig my house is full of crystals says dragon lair uh we'll leave it at that are they blue crystals made by heisenberg or are we talking like amethysts and things? Been lurking, enjoying the company. Have a good night, fish fam, and thanks. Uh, you too, for sure. Appreciate it. Alan Bauer is on his relentless quest to uh, to get me to the AGA, the Aquatic Gardeners Association. I will relay it with you guys if you do want to meet that goal for me. Um, it's very kind of him to be pushing this. He's also ridiculous, and that's why I love him is because... You know, he's like, let's do an aquascape contest. I'll build the web design. I'll build the app. I'll build the interface for evaluation. Like just this guy goes above and beyond for everything. He's always supported the channel so much. I can't thank you enough, Alan. But uh, also I can't uh, I can't in good conscience tell everyone go to the GoFundMe thing and, and send me to chicago uh so i can go to the aquatic gardeners association um i can't do that in good conscience i could do it in bad conscience uh let's see here um uh, how can we sleep when our beds are burning how can we sleep while they stop turning Debbie Lee uh, says, uh, my alien bettas, half moon bettas are beautiful morphs. The colors on them are amazing. I just got this new male half moon betta, and I'm going to post on my channel, and his colors are so bright. 
Right on. That's awesome. Yeah, I like those alien bettas. They're pretty cool looking. Um, been been kind of eyeballing them. Argument for Malaysian trumpet pawn snail. Uh, wait, for Malaysian trumpet pawn snail. Uh, beyond great cleanup. Uh, they turn over the the substrate, which some people want. Some people want an undisturbed deep substrate bed. Personally, me, if it's a shallow substrate, if it's less than three inches, I'll, I'll always put them in. If it's deeper than, say, four, three or four inches of substrate, I don't tend to have many of them or promote many of them anyways because they'll they'll break up the layers of, of uh, like, when you get iron stration um, and sedimentation of the oxidized iron and then you get like a, a small sediment layer and then you'll get like uh the layer of where oxygen stops and these little gas pockets and things like that and all of that gets stirred up and disrupted by those little snails um so if you're trying to do like a filterless aquarium uh it can mess that up that being said if you have an aquarium with a filter planted tanks and aqua soil substrate with a little bit of sand or a little bit of gravel and you're not trying to make some stratified lake bed of a bottom that's, you know, a third of your tank in thickness, then I can totally see why you'd want it churned up, why you'd want those chemicals, the nitrates, uh, the carbon, the, uh, the, the metals and the nutritional value that is in fish poop, the mulm and the plants, why you'd want that mixed up, mixed down, um, so that it can be eaten by anaerobic bacteria and things like that. I totally get it. Um, you're growing out a tricolor uh, Yazakura Madaka. Hopefully I can trade with you for some blue Malawa shrimp, says Nino Franklin. Yes, yes, you can. Uh, I would love to get a hold of some of those fish. I, I, I would really like to get a hold of more Madaka again this year since so many got wiped out last year. I just have my reds and my platinums or my red caps and my platinums. But um, yeah, the Malawa colony got demolished, if you saw the video, 330 dead um, that I counted, and there were more than that even. And then uh, 40 of them died just by um, whatever, the, the, the heater, and were pregnant, were were pregnant and and lost all those little babies that they would have had otherwise and so assuming that maybe say 15 of each of those females babies would have survived 15 times 40 ugh, ugh, that's a bad number it's like what 450 or something i don't know that's probably not correct <laughs> but um yeah it's just it, yeah it it's frustrating. I do have the normal Malawas. Now, the blue Malawas, um, I have some of in a tank. Their tank didn't get affected, but I did sell a good chunk of them um, just to kind of get by on things. That's actually how uh, that, along with membership fees, super just, that's how I got the new compressor mic um, that I'm working with here. Uh, that's also how I got the new webcam and some of the new software stuff that I'm working on also. Um, and so I appreciate it all. Um, but with the model, it'll probably be still a little longer to uh, figure out um, what I need to do. Regina, what a ride. You are the best. Such great info as usual. Thanks, Alex. Every single one of the chat crew. Oh, and everyone. Regina, you are so very welcome, my dear. Thank you so very much. Uh, so much appreciated. Um, it's time. Hi, it's time to talk about plants. Go fund Alexander Williamson uh, of the Secret History of Living in Your Aquarium. In the video, he makes about the AGA convention. <laughs> Alan, uh, you're on a roll tonight. Are you in the brandy? Have you in brandy met? Brandy, you're a fine girl. What a good wife you would be for my life. My log and non drummy bold eye is. Wait. 
wait, my life, my love, and my lady is the sea. Oh, yeah, my life, my love, and my Laganandra Buddha is the uh, uh, planted aquarium. No, it doesn't, it doesn't work. There's just no way. Uh, it's just, just too much, man. Too much, too much. You need too much. Uh, gold panda arandas. She wants in it. Uh, sing it, Alex. Oh, you don't, you don't want that. You don't want that. Nyambi, Nyambui. Hello. Welcome. DT Infusoria. Uh, hey, bro. I just learned how to grow in Infusoria, but where can I get Daphnia for a culture? Um, outside. If you leave it outside, um, a lot of times some dead leaves and soil, like you, you might get weird mold and growth and stuff like that in it but i mean if you start a couple even just like pot bottles like that you clean out thoroughly um or water bottles or whatever um jars and you just put water in there and let it sit for 24 hours or whatever so that the chlorine chloramine that's out then you can leave it in the sun with a piece of kale or um, a piece of broccoli or any sort of vegetative matter really leave that glass in the sun, you'll get green algae filled water, then the Daphnia will come. Uh, and that's when you can uh, just look for like, um, if you know any ponds or areas where water puddles up, you can grab some of that mucky dirt, even if it's dried out, there are eggs of the Daphnia in there. Sometimes they'll just appear on their own, but you'll have better luck if you bring a few of the leaves and some of that soil into there now you may also raise the kraken or do something else uh when that happens uh that could be parasitic or problematic um so just keep an eye out that you're not like raising any like bristle worm eggs or something that could be harmful to the fish it's unlikely that you will be uh marshall joe's uh, or is that yaos yo uh yoas uh alexander what's a hobby outside the fish keeping hobby and the arts um music 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 thanks to andy we are one step closer to bringing me to the aga apparently um <laughs> uh all right well thank you andy uh you make my heart sing wild thing boom, 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 boom. Pass the duchy on the left hand side, you know, you make me jump and sound. I talk about who make me hooky, ricky, dance and dance around. Um, seed shrimp just appear in my tubs. Yeah, that's right. Seed shrimp just appear in my tubs. I don't know where from. Why is this love chat? It's a love chat, baby. Bot talk, baby. Bot talk. We got bot talk taking over chat so it's a good place to end tonight love chat but love chat but love chat well i got me a car and it's as big as a whale it's a chrysler and it fits about 20 so pile on in and bring your jukebox money it's a love shack we're a little old place where love bots get destroyed by alan all right Thank you, Alan, for getting rid of that crap. Uh, Patty's Petite Tanks, what's up? Uh, where did Naked Dating HD go? Is this stream too classy for Naked HD? I get an HD camera, and all of a sudden we start getting HD bots. What's up with that? Get out of here, bots. I know it's you, you communists. You're trying to, trying to break down my, my beta chat. You know what? I've been in the sun the last... The light just... The camera just kind of adjusted kind of made it a little bit better for me um you know i can i can i can make myself look a little bit better um uh, but i look so white with that there, I, I am just really white but i've been in the sun i promise guys interview with the vampire next live stream uh all right guys i'm gonna get out of here uh if it's the last thing that we ever do uh there's got to be a better life for me and you uh, thank you so very much. Yeah, prayers to Mary. Wait, no. What happened to Mary? Did something happen to me? Please tell me nothing happened to Mary. 
what's what's going on? Um, what did I miss? Um, and uh, my thoughts and best wishes are going out to any of you healing up from surgery, especially in New Zealand. Uh, she went to the hospital. Okay. All right. I got to give her a call. I'm going to give her a call. Um, crap. All right. I hope she's doing okay. Yeah. Seriously. Prayers to Mary. Uh, what an awesome woman, a strong woman. I, probably too much. Uh, it's her liver is what it is. I'm almost certain. That's what it's been over and over again. Uh, she, she needs, probably needs a new one, I think. Um, but she is just incredible and, uh, yeah, I gotta, I gotta call her. Uh, how do you sex cherry shrimp? I've got a bunch of videos on that. Um, check out the videos on them species profiles and you'll, you'll figure it out. Um, uh, or I'll answer you in the questions later, but I gotta go. I'm sorry. I'm out of questions. Oh, she had emergency gallbladder surgery removal. Oh man. Okay, I got to call her. I, why am I the last to know? Usually, Mary and I talk frequently. Um, I've just been busy lately. Uh, okay, guys, thank you for letting me know. I'll talk to Calvin and see what the heck is going on. Holy cow. All right, guys, thank you so very much for your uh, support of the stream, for having a fun stream, uh, and uh, also for just being awesome, for watching the channel. Um, and... Uh, that, uh, you know, uh, you guys all rock. Keep on rocking in the free world. Uh, night, everybody. Night, Patty. Thank you so much, Super Chatters replayers. Uh, Alexander Engelhart for buying 50 people memberships. Guys, go to the community tab. Check out the new perks of being a member if you got a free membership. And uh, if you didn't, uh, maybe you want to check it out anyways. Buck 99 plus. The community tab has a bunch of posts for everyone not only limited to members. Uh, I made this week's fishery open to everyone because I'm a sucker. Uh, hey, Jeff Kane, uh, sorry we're wrapping it up, but I got to get out of here. Um, all right. Uh, yeah, totally dragon there. All right, guys, have a good one. And uh, thank you again for being you. Take care of your critters. And of course, take care of yourself because if you don't do that, you can't take care of all the lovely things around you that you care about. Uh, so I will see you guys uh, for a live stream on Friday, most likely. Yeah, Friday at, at 4.30 probably, uh, 4.30 Pacific. And uh, I'll be releasing some more videos this week. Talk to you guys later. Thank you.